David is a seasoned and serial entrepreneur who's currently the managing partner at Centiro Ventures, which is a Dallas-based AI VC fund. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. And I actually connected with David where uh, when he gave a version of this talk at UT Dallas. So I got a lot of value out of the talk, which is why I got super excited and knew I needed to get David to give, come give the same talk in the Data Entrepreneurs. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, David, and you can get into the workshop. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Well, I, I appreciate you, appreciate everyone for being here today. And, um, you know, I, I, kind of the, the, the ground rules for me it, it is, you know, my, my goal here is to answer your questions and, and be a resource for you, not to necessarily hear myself talk. So if you have questions, use the hand raise, drop something in the chat, and I'll try to incorporate it as we go. We also should have plenty of time at the end for, for any kind of uh, questions or uh, or open discussion. So, a little bit more background. A uh, little bit more background on me. Uh, I generally am a I refer to myself as a technologist, entrepreneur, and investor in that order. Started coding at 14 on a TI-85 graphing calculator. Did my first work with AI and ML in the late 90s on a project for NASA uh, when they were uh, when they were launching the International Space Station. Worked on a uh, on a probability system to determine whether they're going to have enough components of the spacesuit uh, to fulfill. Uh, to, to fulfill the shuttle flights that were required for putting up the, the, the space station. The company I sold eight years ago at one point was number 176 on the Inc. 500 and the sixth fastest growing retailer in the country. Um, and we leveraged, heavily leveraged technology as, as part of that business, including predictive models and, uh, and data analytics to do things like predictive pricing and determine when uh, when events were w will sell out. Um, after selling Easy Seat, I made the made the switch over the other side of the table to to become an investor. First with RevTech Ventures, a, a, a retail technology focused fund, um, and most recently working on my own fund, Centiero Ventures, where we focus exclusively on AI enabled software. And when I say AI enabled software, we are not. I love generative AI, but I think that that's somewhat subtle science and, and that it's more of a platform play that you're going to see one by big tech or big tech supported initiatives. But the real opportunity for entrepreneurs is going to be in building the, the things out of the scope of open AI, the, the vertical market solutions, the function based solutions, and, and even the, the solutions that are based on data that's not on the Internet. Because contrary to popular, the contrary to popular belief, and as much as it seems like um, as much as it seems like, you know, large language models like um, the lar large language models like, uh, you know, uh, GPT and Llama 2 know everything about everything, they don't know some of the things that are locked behind closed doors of, of large corporations and they, they don't have the clarity and the nuance that, that's available. So um, I, I preface that to say, that, to really say that there is a massive amount of opportunities for entrepreneurs to be successful with AI. And that it doesn't just stop with that doesn't just stop with chat gpt so without further ado i'm going to jump right into the right into the top 10 questions you're going to get asked by ai investors including someone like me and the, the number one question you're going to get asked is does it solve an actual problem right and we we've seen this before over and over and over again you know you hear it in the industry parlance of you know it's just a thin wrapper over uh, over gpt um and part of that is because some of the solutions that have come out in our in our rush to market over the course of the last call it 18 months, we've just tried to go and throw technology at the wall and say, hey, it's AI, right? And it's it's no different than throwing Wi-Fi into a toaster. It's like, hey, I threw Wi-Fi into a toaster. It's like, okay, good for you, but whose problem are you actually solving? What do they actually do? What are they actually looking for? Um, is this actually something that's requisite? And, and in a lot of cases, we're talking to companies right now that the problem doesn't need AI. The you know, um, it it's a problem that can be solved with traditional software, and that's okay. Like that's one of the things that we talk to a lot of companies about is that you don't necessarily need to be an AI company to be successful over the course of the next uh, over the the, the the next ten years. It's really about can you solve someone's problem. And if you're going to try to solve their problem with artificial intelligence, is it going to be something that is a better solution that's available on the market already? So really try to understand, do you understand the problem you're trying to solve? And do you understand how AI fits into that, into that, particular, into that particular solution set? 
Question number two is how resilient will your solution be to market change? You know, one of the most recent Y Combinator batches, uh, over 36% of the, the over 36% of the applications had some AI component. Right. And what does that mean? It just means everybody is chasing after AI. And kind of as you think about the problem you're solving, as you think about what you're building, you know, are you sort of trying to build something that's a flavor of the moment? And this goes hand in hand with this goes hand in hand with question number one is, you know, are you building something that has staying power? I was talking to a futurist recently and he called it, you know, what is that sort of root challenge that, that people are trying to are trying to cause? Because there's generational challenges that we all face, things like the need for entertainment, the need to uh, need to eat, you need to earn money. Like there's sort of root, you know, there's sort of root needs that people have. And if you can solve a root need, you're not just going to be throwing AI over an existing problem. But if you are going to try to go just throw AI at a problem, understand that it is an incredibly competitive market space. We had the busiest year we've ever seen in terms of deal flow in 2023, and we expect that to continue because AI is just become it's become part of the consumer parlance, and you need to be able to to, to be able to dis- differentiate. Question two A doesn't solve an actual problem. You might recognize this one. It's the very first question. I I can't stress enough that I cannot stress enough that you have to solve somebody's problems, whether it's AI, whether it's mobile, whether it's the web, you have to solve somebody to solve somebody's problem. Question number three, uh, question number three that, that we're going to ask you is, is this really just a feature or a product? And one of the things that uh, one of the things that's happened in, in the, the rush to get to uh, in, in the rush to get to market is we've really just built AI solutions for the sake of building AI solutions. And what we haven't thought about is how is this a broader scale opportunity or a broader scale solution? And when you start thinking about your comp- you know, when you start thinking about your competition is if you have a fully featured product, right? So if you go and build an AI first or an AI native CRM, you you get ahead of the game on Salesforce and HubSpot and Pipedrive because you're AI native, right? But it takes time. Like building a fully featured CRM is going to take you time. But you can go out and use GPT. You can go out and use Llama 2 and you go build features that sit on top of an existing CRM. But the challenge is, uh, the challenge is you just become a feature. And if you're just a feature of Pipedrive or a feature of HubSpot, you know, nothing stops them from uh, nothing stops them from implementing that feature, right? So you you don't have a whole lot of market uh, a whole lot of market defensibility. Now, the ideal thread the needle scenario is: can you get something to market quickly that begins to capture market share while you're building out the bigger product? But that may be your uh, that may be your impetus for raising venture capital, right? Is that you just need to build a you need to build a complete solution. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna unseat HubSpot with the first AI native, uh, sort of an AI native or an AI first CRM, you need to go raise venture capital, build a bunch of product before you go and launch, because it can't just be a, a simple feature, uh, a, a simple feature of the uh, of the CRM. But even if it's a feature or it's a product, you got to solve the core question, right? And I promise I'll stop beating this dead horse sometime soon. Um, but it it is incredibly critical, and that's why I uh, that's why I continue to repeat it. Question number four is that, that you're going to get asked is Do you have any proprietary data or intellectual property associated with your uh, with your organization? And one of the big challenges right now, if you if you look at um, if you look at the world of AI, is that if you have unique data you can set yourself apart, right? You know, one of the reasons why the ML- LLMs tend to, f- tend to feel somewhat omniscient is because they have access to so much data that's been cataloged on the web. But, um, you know, they don't have access to data behind closed doors. So, you know, one of the examples I, I like to use is the, there, there's a company, uh, there's, a, there's a mining company called Barrick, uh, Barrick Gold. 
Um, and they've got 125 years worth of soil composition data. They've got a, they've got 125 years worth of geologic data and, um, and, 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 uh, and geographic data that they can now leverage to train models. That's a moat and that's an opportunity that someone else doesn't have. But you don't have to be a company that, that has that longitudinal history. You just have to collect data in an AI first way, right? How do you create, how do you collect information not just data because there's plenty of companies and there's plenty of incumbents that don't actually have good data right so when you look at crms like hubspot yeah they have a lot of data but is it usable information to train models to deliver outcomes and i would argue that it hasn't been collected with that uh, with that in mind and you can set yourself apart by collecting data in a way that's ai ready but when you're thinking of, uh, when you're thinking about it and uh, when you're thinking about uh, when you're thinking about it in the long run is you need to think about how are you going to ultimately manage your storage training and inference costs because one of the big changes that we're seeing for AI companies, uh, especially by comparison to traditional SaaS companies, is that there is a real cost of good. In traditional SaaS, you didn't you didn't have what I would characterize as a as a cost of goods. The uh, the cost of goods in traditional SaaS, each incremental user it really has very, very little impact on your costs to service your user base. However, when we're talking about AI, every single interaction has an inference cost and has an associated cost. So you need to have a plan for how you are going to manage your cost of goods in the long run. Are you going to restrict? Are you going to go to usage-based billing? But ultimately, you need to have a plan and an approach to make certain that each incremental user does not end up be, end up eating away into your profits. From some of the studies I've seen is that uh, Microsoft with GitHub Copilot, it projects on average that they lose $20 per user on every GitHub Copilot user, right? Because it's an all you can eat subscription. And, you know, the same person that uh, same person that's invoking Copilot once a week is paying the same as the person that's uh, invoking it, you know, four times an hour. So it's something that you need to think about in your strategy early because it's a very, very hard shift to make without churning customers to go from monthly billing to usage-based billing or to go to some hybrid of monthly plus uh, monthly plus usage. More importantly, uh, not more importantly, but question number six is, is your product sticky? Um, going back to that, uh, going back to that, uh, the, that analog of, you know, you're building on top of HubSpot or building on top of Salesforce. One of the other challenges that we're facing is that it is when you're making it easy for people to onboard, you're also making it easy, easy for them to offboard, right? And one of the trends that we're seeing in the marketplace right now is that there's lots of experimental AI budgets in the ecosystem. So we're seeing lots of companies that are throwing money at AI. But you're not just going to throw you're not going to throw money at an AI driven solution and move all of your salespeople over to it, right? That's you're not going to do that. But you might in a departmental scenario, or you might kick the tires on something. So you know it, it depending on how quickly and easily your users can offboard, right? How quickly can they move to a new CRM? How can how quickly can they move to a new system is really going to drive your long-term competitive advantage and how much you churn as we move from experimental budgets of just seeing what AI can do to actual production budgets where you start putting it in front of users and make it, making it a little bit more sticky. But you want to make certain that your product is sticky from, uh, from the outset. You know, one of the things that um, the, one of the other questions you're going to get asked by knowledgeable AI investors is how do you deal with the risks, right? And when I talk about AI risks, I'm not talking about the Terminator, right? I, mean, I, I, I think we're, my personal opinion is that we're a good deal away from, from AGI and we're going to need some architectural changes before we get to it. But the real risks of AI are things like data privacy or things like hallucinations and accuracy things like data bias you know how are you dealing with those underlying uh, with those underlying challenges that ai today presents and one of my biggest frustrations is that we spend so much time thinking about what's going to happen 10 years from now, 10 years from now with ai and we lose the forest for the trees that we have real problems that we have real problems like hallucinations and data bias and data poisoning and data drift that need to be baked into your solution today not just something that you're going to go and, and deal with 10 years from now right and so how are you going to deal with those current day risks of, uh, of artificial intelligence 
And you know, something we we've talked about a little bit before is you know, is your revenue model sustainable? It's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a a, a confluence of of two different options yeah. or two of the prior questions is you know are you getting ex, ex, are you getting experimental budgets? Are you getting um, you know are you getting experimental budgets and are you getting um, uh, um, are you going to be able to sustain the cost of goods in the long term? But most importantly, when you start thinking about this particular uh, this particular question, is um, uh, as you go through uh, as you go through time, um, why do customers uh, why do customers stay with you? Right? Do you have the the AWS and Snowflake problem? where customers start to churn because what worked in the lab environment right and you working with one user you work with two users does that work for them in the long term when you start moving to a usage-based model or if you started with a usage-based model does that usage-based model still meet their needs from a you know to, when we talk about problem solving it's all what does that problem cost me and how much uh, how much of an incremental savings do you have from your solution and the the difficulty that you run into is over time how does that decay and will you be able to make the make the leap to to a full deployment or to a, to a different pricing model another problem that we're we're seeing with lots of ai first and ai native companies is whether you can source enough talent to scale um because this is a very very limited uh skill set you know, to when, especially when we're talking about LLMs and we're talking about sort of some of the the more advanced techniques and training, there's maybe ten thousand people in the world that have actual hands on um, uh, uh, hands on experience yeah. with that tool and with that technology, and you know we're expecting them to, to to grow in trees. We just haven't built a talent pipeline for it. It's incredibly mathematics heavy. It's a it's a different modality than traditional coding. And you need to have a plan for how you're going to be able to hire people into uh, into these roles. And it's it, it, it's a somewhat intractable problem, um, but you need to have a plan for how you're going to deal with it as the company scales and as you get more sophisticated with your underlying tooling. And last but not least is is something that that we characterize as are you solving yesterday's problem right and uh, the example i tend to use is uh, is the rfp process the request for proposal process where you have a large company or a government puts out a a request for proposal and companies all go and fill out a standardized format of information to respond to uh, to respond to that rfp well, what's the real reason for the RFP? The reason for an RFP is so that uh, the company or the, uh, the company or the government can get a standardized set of responses. But do we really need that anymore? Right? The RFP in and of itself is just a means to an end of getting a standardized set of responses. Well, couldn't we just have the company submit their information, financial models, quotes, company background information, presentations, and then simply ask questions of the data and, and interrogate it and let AI do the analysis, right? So it, it, it's entirely possible. And the need for an RFP is really something that that's the it, that's not the need, right? The, the RFP is just the way we've solved it over the course of the last 40 years. What's the real need? And that's what the, what's the real need is I just need to get information to make an informed decision. So, right? I, so as you start thinking about how you solve problems, are you solving the way it was or the way it's going to be? And really think about whether your whether your company or your product is solving the problem the way it's going to be or the way it, the, the way it was. So that was the last question, but I'll give you one bon one bonus question. Um, and the, the bonus question is, you know, should I raise venture capital? And my answer to that is probably, but also likely. Not. I like to show this graph because um, that big blue dot that you can actually see are all of the companies the, the, that are that don't at, have access to get venture capital. Uh, and what that means is companies that just aren't venture scalable. As a venture investor, I need to return 20 to 40 times my investment. That means you need to have a massive market and a massive opportunity, and you need to be going after you, you need to be going after essentially billion dollar opportunities. And just not every company is going after a, a billion dollar opportunity. You probably can't see it on here, but there's a little pink dot at the bottom are the companies that actually um, that that actually raise venture capital, and there's an imperceptible dot that's about one pixel. Uh, that's about one pixel. 
the is the number of companies that reach a billion dollar valuation. So venture capital is a tool to help you execute on your strategy more quickly, but it is not a strategy in and of itself. All of the companies you see on the right hand side of your screen are companies that were it, it achieved massive success without raising venture capital but it is a tool to move more quickly and in this sort of age of fast times to market with ai and rapid iteration with ai you know we do need the you you may need to consider bringing on capital to be able to execute more quickly or hire some of that scarce talent that's going to that's going to command a a price premium so with that i think i'm Right about at time of where we were supposed to end up. Happy to uh, happy to answer questions or, or take the conversation in in any direction. Um, you all see fit. Let's give David a round of applause. Um, so yeah, let's open it for a Q and A. So I see we just have the heat in the audience. Uh, Vahid, if you have any questions, feel free to come off mute or drop it in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, first of all. And then I have one question. So, you, uh, David, you as a, a seasoned entrepreneur, you definitely came up with a lot of ideas before. Mm -hmm. So, as as a first step, how do you validate your idea is going to work out? I know you need to answer all of those questions that you just mentioned here, but sure. for example, personally, how do you validate? Okay, I have this idea. Is it going to work? I guess what. So in in a lot of cases, I mean, for us as a as a fund, what we fund, what we tend to look for is founders that understand the market that they're going after, right? So we yeah. invest primarily in B two B software. So we place a very high priority on founders that understand that market, and the reason for that is that that's your very first step in validation. Your that the first step in validation is I used to work in e commerce while i was in e-commerce i noticed this problem and i've gone and built a, a solution for it there's a there's an example here um i'm blanking on the name of the company but um that i really it's mercado um that's here in dallas and it was the first time i met with the founder um this is five or six years ago which is why i'm having a hard time remembering first time i met with the founder he said you know i've spent 25 years in international shipping you know, I, I've moved on to the second stage of my career. I decided to retire, take an early buyout. And now I've kind of made it my mission to fix the problem I've been trying to solve for the last 25 years. And I want to go build software for it. And he's got an amazing traction with it, right? So really, that's the number one number one way to, to start to validate is to have that understanding of the problem yourself from a first-hand basis. Secondarily to that, you can conduct customer interviews. I'm not a huge fan of going at it with just customer interviews because I don't have anything on the line, right? As And, and there's weird human dynamics that come into play that if you come to me and say, hey, David, you know, I'd really like to understand kind of the challenges you face as a venture investor. You know, I want to be nice. I want to be helpful. I'm generally not going to tell you that. Yeah, no, I'd never pay you for that. Uh, I'd very much give you the, uh, I'd very much give you kind of the rosy picture version of the responses because I want to be encouraging. I don't want to talk about it even as a VC, right? You know, even yes. though you're, you're, you, even though I'm not investing with you, I'm an entrepreneur before I'm a VC, and I want to be encouraging, and I want to see you go after the, go after that opportunity because. Even though it's not a venture opportunity, you may you may be able to go and, and build a life changing business on the back of your idea. So, I, customer interviews are okay, but ideally, your best case scenario is dovetailing those customer interviews into either a design partner or an early buyer, right? To where that's your number one validator out of uh, above above all else. The moment someone pays you for the product or service you deliver is the moment that you've got real validation that there's a market. No idea how big it's going to be, but you've got validation that there's somebody somewhere that will that will pay you for what you do. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, really good question. Anything else, Vahid? Well, we got David here. Got I think that's of it. experience here. Yeah, it's valuable. Yeah. I think that's it for now. Hopefully, I can get in touch later if I have anything come up. Is that one I think? My side. Yeah, for sure. Well, I got a few questions as well. You know, toward the end, you sure. kind of gave us that bonus question where for a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, maybe VC is not uh, the right approach. 
And so what would you say is like the difference, like fundamental differences in mindset between if you're trying to build a billion dollar business versus you're trying to build like a million dollar business or like a $10 million business, mm -hmm. like does your list of questions change or are there any kind of fundamental shifts that you'd have to make? I mean, it, it doesn't really change our questions and screening. You know, the very first thing that we're going to do as an investor to look at is look at the market opportunity, right? So if you it, if you're going after if you're going after market with a finite number of participants, right? We can do some pretty quick back in the, back of the nap back of the napkin mathematics and say, is this going to be a large enough business, right? So you've got just for sake of simplicity, you've got a market that's got two thousand companies in it. And it, you know, there's 2,000 companies in it, and you're going to charge them $1,000 a year. Well, what does that really mean? You can do $2 million a year in revenue. That caps the size of your market, unless you can now demonstrate that, well, it's not just that market and those 2,000 companies. There's this other 10,000 we can sell to, or these other revenue streams that we can generate. So that's the first thing that we do, regardless of sort of the, the way a founder is wired it's really are you going after a big enough opportunity because they're the best way to build a venture scale business is go after a big market and capture a small piece of it you can build venture businesses by being the best op the, the best player in a narrow market and capture large market share but that's a much finer line to navigate and it, it requires a very very specific team and a very specific go to market strategy to be able to do it so we evaluate it that way the others the others really are understanding the mind the, the mindset of the founder and what they're looking to accomplish right is um are you looking for you know are, are you are you looking to create uh, are you looking to create personal wealth or are you looking to create generational wealth are you looking to create a, a as are you look uh, are you comfortable with owning 20% of a large pie or do you really want to own uh, you know uh, 80 to 100% of a smaller pie and you know there, there there's trade offs both ways right? like the 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 top end is the, the top end is far more limited owning 80% However, your control of the off ramps is far better when you own uh, uh, when you own one hundred percent. I think that uh, that last point is really important, and I think a lot of like early entrepreneurs, you know, it's like you want it to be. It's like mine. It's like this mine syndrome. Like you want it to be my business, like my way. But kind of like to your point, like when you are able to share the pie it really can in like or it increases the pie by like an order of magnitude so maybe you're capped at like a 10 million dollar business if you own 100 percent of it but like what we were what you were saying before we hopped on the call is uh you know if you just take 20 percent of a hundred million dollar business you'll be much better off absolutely and in there is the it's actually one of the biggest challenges the that we face is if you're a founder that's cons that's heavily concerned with dilution early on you're probably not you're you're probably not a good fit for venture capital right like you need to understand now dil understanding dilution and understanding how much dilution you're taking is important and no company you know there's so much data available on the typical dilution the typical amount of dilution a company takes generally at the early stages it's somewhere between 20 and 25 percent as you get later it drops to being between 10 and 15. but if you're starting to get super concerned over a half a percentage point of dilution at the seed stage you're probably not thinking the right way for building a venture scale business and it that is a signal when, when we talk about you know identifying is somebody a good fit for building a venture business that is one of the signals like if you're if you're worried about half a percentage point and in a round if you're if you're getting 20 percent dilution around that normally gets 25 percent and you're worried about an extra half percent we're probably going to have problems seeing you scale in, in the long run yeah that's really interesting so like when the founder's overly concerned about dilution like this half a percentage point uh that's a red flag what do you see as some other red flags um kind of like in your experience of seeing a lot of founders come in and out 
specifically related to founders or or even just uh, startups and businesses, even maybe even larger scale companies. I mean, one of the challenges I, I see quite often on the startup side is the "if you build it, they will come" syndrome. You know, kind of dovetails into the into the "are you actually solving a problem?" question, um, and assuming that consumers will change their behavior because you built it. Um, and that's really not the case. And, and one of my, uh, one of my favorite examples, you know, the, one of my favorite examples tends to be Uber, right? Did Uber really change consumer behavior? Well, no, not really. Like they launched in cab first cities. They launched in San Francisco and in New York and Chicago and Boston that were cab first. And they just created a better experience to your existing workflow. They didn't create something and get people to magically overnight. They didn't create taxi service they created a better way to interact with taxi service in in the process expanded market share of essentially cab service but they didn't create that they didn't create change to start and that's one of the biggest challenges and biggest red flags is sort of stubbornly expecting people to conform to your way of thinking one of the other red flags when when i you know use the word stubborn uh, one of the other red flags for us is that somebody that's stubbornly attached to sort of my way or the highway one of the things i can tell you is um and and, and it, this, this tends to change based on what company you've started you know the first company you want everything to, you want everything to go your way you want to go according to your plan and you want to control everything by the time you get to your later your later stage companies you're most you're usually focused on the end prize right is the the end goal is creating a 50 million dollar company you do what you need to do and if if customers require you know, if you need to change the market you go after if you need to change your brand messaging if you need you know, whatever you need to change you're open to changing it because you're focused on the end goal not on the ownership of the process and the thing and that's a chain that's a thing that uh, that founders struggle with quite frequently especially first time founders yeah um let's see vahid do you have any other any other questions come up i want to give you the opportunity i don't want to just hijack the q a i think you asked a lot of good questions one of the red flag was also my question that you already asked so i appreciate that not nothing anymore right now okay so i guess we can try to wrap it all up uh David, do you have any like and any like last pieces yeah. of advice that you can yeah. offer, you know, entrepreneurs early in their career, founders, whether they're trying to go the VC route or whether they're trying to build uh, something smaller and build that generational wealth, perhaps mm -hmm. any kind of last piece of advice uh, based on your experience? I mean, ultimately, I would say it really comes down to don't sweat the venture not venture thing focus on uh, focus on solving a customer's problem doing it in a way that generates value for them and everything else will take care of itself right whether you go venture funding whether you self finance whether you bootstrap you know we we what we've done in popular media is we've turned business building into like it's this formulaic thing and, and it's not. There's lots of different ways to there, there's lots of different ways to build and scale a business, even if you're in an established business. Right? If you're going to go and be my my very first business, I was a painting contractor, right? And there's a thousand different ways to build a painting contracting firm. And there is no right way. There is no formulaic way to do it. There is nothing formulaic about building business because you are in charge of your team, your idea, your company and your customers in this particular moment in time in 2024. What someone did 10 years ago, there may be some echoes that will carry forward, but there's also opportunity to innovate and change and the market's gonna grow and change. So you should be ready and, and prepared for that. And you know, don't worry so much about the truisms of, oh, go raise venture or you know, don't raise venture or whatever the case may be. So.